Artificial intelligence, AI, is already transforming our societies and economies, creating jobs and growth. But are we ready for the dark side? How it's consolidating power, weakening nation states, corrupting our information ecosystem, and destroying democracy. My name is Maria Ressa, and in this episode of Studio B on Artificial Intelligence, we'll be hearing from two inspiring women, courageous whistleblowers in their own rights, working to make AI fairer, safer, more responsible. Camille Francois is a researcher experienced in combating disinformation and digital harms. Today, she's helping lead French President Macron's landmark initiative on AI and democracy. Meredith Whitaker blew the whistle inside the industry about AI's largely unchecked harms and led the Google walkout in 2019. Nowadays, she's president of Signal, the secure messaging app. So. How do we protect ourselves from mass disinformation and distinguish between what's real and fake online? Is AI embedding surveillance into our lives, creating our new dystopia? And how do we make big tech accountable? Meredith, I'm so happy to be here with you tonight. So you're the president of Signal, my favorite way to send messages uh, these days, and you're an AI scholar in your own right. You co-founded an AI research organization called AI Now, which you continue to advise. And I actually had the great pleasure of sharing an office with you when we were both colleagues at Google, yeah. which is 10 years ago. <laughs> um, yeah, Two years know. ago. <laughs> Back then, you were already interested in machine learning and its yeah. impact on society. Yeah. I mean, I remember these formative conversations, talking with you, talking with, a, you know, let's say, a concerned whisper network about what is going on. Why is this, you know, at that point, more unproven, still unproven technology you know, being infiltrated into so many products and services at Google? Why is everyone being incentivized to develop machine learning? It, what actually is this? And why are we trusting such significant determinations about our lives and our institutions to systems that are trained on data that we know to be faulty, that we know to be biased, that we know not to reflect you know, the contexts or you know, criteria in which these systems are used? So that this was, was the formative beginning of what I think at the time we called a machine learning fairness conversation yeah. over and across the company. Well, that was, I think it was around 2014. And so I think so there's sort of a... It was 10 years ago. It was. <laughs> ah, um, um, we're looking great. Um, um, I think that is an important date because we can you know, zoom out on the conversation on artificial intelligence, which sort of touches everything and nothing at once in our current context. And we can actually recognize that artificial intelligence as a term is over 70 years old, right? So then we need to confront the question, okay, so why now, why in the last 10 years is it so hyped? But it is a pivotal moment for AI right now. Wouldn't you say that? Well, we're certainly being told that, and there's certainly a lot of resources, a lot of attention, a lot of investment that is riding on this being a pivotal moment. But again, what happened in 2012, right? In 2012, it was shown by a number of researchers that techniques developed in the late 1980s could do new things when they were matched with huge amounts of data and huge amounts of computational power. And so why is that important? Well, huge amounts of data and huge server infrastructures, these massive computers with sort of new and more powerful chips are the resources that are concentrated in the hands of a handful of large companies based in the US and China, largely, and that are sort of the product of this surveillance advertising business model that was shaped in the 90s, that grew through the 2010s, 
And then, you know, in 2012, there was a recognition that we can do more than sell advertisers access to demographic profiles for personalized advertising on your Gmail, on your Facebook, wherever you encounter it. We can use this same resources to train AI models, to infiltrate new markets, to make claims about intelligence and computational sophistication that can give us more power over your lives and institutions. So I think we really need to have a political economic view to look at the business models, who wins and who loses, and then look at who's telling us this is a pivotal moment, right? So that's interesting because the way that our current moment is also being framed is around this rupture. This is sort of the moment that leads to the generation of technology in AI that we call generative AI. And I think that what you're saying is it's not particularly helpful to see this as a, as a rupture, and it's helpful to see the continuity of the development of AI. Well, it's helpful to investors who are recovering from losses on the metaverse, who are recovering from losses on Web3, to see this as a transformative moment, right? There's a right. lot riding on this, but you know, it's not necessarily true, wave. right? You can make a lot of money by people believing it's true, long enough that you get an IPO or an acquisition. It doesn't need to actually be true. But, right, we didn't start talking about this in 2017, right? Like, we hadn't been info, you know, inundated with claims about you know, AI mimicking or surpassing humans in the same way we are now. ChatGPT wasn't everywhere. When did we start talking about this? I started playing with GPT, I would say, wow. around 2018. But I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. had well, a... you have always been ahead of the curve. <laughs> I, 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 you know, it's. It, I think I just like uh, playing with those models. I remember um, uh, playing with GPT two, and trying to think about what this means for our society if everybody starts having access to the means to create synthetic text. Um, and at that time, there was not a lot of uses of these uh, generative AI models for text. And so, you know, I was playing this with this idea that when we had deep fakes, we were going to have read fakes, a sort of uh, now a whole ocean of synthetic text that was going to take over all these online spaces. And I thought it would be fun to have, um, to have the AI write an op-ed around the consequences of read fakes, um, which it did. It generated this metaphor, which I thought was really interesting, of synthetic text was going to be the gray goo of the internet. It was going to suddenly creeping everywhere as sort of a science fiction idea that it was going to really ruin the internet as we knew it. And I think that was, that was 2019, yeah. yeah. yeah mimicking um, self-awareness. Yeah, um, <laughs> something along these lines. Yeah. Of course, you and some practitioners and people who are deep in the field have been playing with these different techniques for a while. But it wasn't until Microsoft started spending millions of dollars a month to stand up and, you know, to, to create and deploy ChatGPT that we started talking about it. And we need to recognize that it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars a day to run this, that it's actually extremely computationally expensive. And so that these are not, you know, these are not technologies of the many, right? We are the subjects of AI. We are not the users of AI in most cases. I think this is also why it has, for some of us, felt like a pivotal moment because back when it was very much, you know, still research projects or conversations between practitioners, we kind of had the luxury to ask ourselves, well, what does it mean, for instance, for disinformation that now everybody can produce synthetic text? Or what does it mean when we know that there are biases and stereotypes that are embedded in this machine? How would we go about thinking the impact on society? And I think that changes scale in terms of the urgency of those questions when suddenly everybody has access to these technologies yeah. and they're suddenly being deployed really quickly in society. Yeah. There's been a community of scholars who have sort of preceded a lot of these you know, advancements or Microsoft deciding just to deploy a text generator with no connection to truth onto the public, you know, those decisions were not made because they were reviewing the scholarship, were reviewing your work, Camille, were recognizing other social consequences. Those decisions were made because every quarter they need to report to their board positive predictions or results around profit and growth. And so we have these powerful technologies being ultimately controlled by a handful of companies that will always put those objective functions, to use a machine learning term, first. 
how do we leverage power? Well, there's a classic answer to that, and that is, you know, workers banding together to use their collective leverage to you know, push their employers. I love it. I find it very French of you. Yeah. Well, I was almost <laughs> not here because of a Eurostar strike, so I hope they win. <laughs> um, yes. Let's talk a little bit about um, those harms that you're saying a lot of people have been talking about, have been documented. Let's explain, for instance, what do we mean when we say they're coded bias in these algorithms? These machine learning systems in this bigger is better paradigm, which we've been in since 2012, relies on data collected and created about our present and our past. This data in the context of text generation comes from things like 4chan, Reddit, YouTube comments, Wikipedia, and of course that data reflects our scarred past and present, which is discriminatory, which has been and is racist and misogynist, which sees different people as deserving different treatment. And so, of course, that data is going to be reflected in the outputs of this system. And now the danger here is that we buy the hype and that we say this is the product of a sentient and intelligent machine that is giving us objective truth. And that is just where that person fits in society. They have the genes of a janitor, right? And so I think there's, you know, when we see the rise in this eugenic thinking, when we see this blind faith in machines, we really need to recognize what exactly that is naturalizing. Yeah. And you're right, of course, to talk about how so many of these stereotypes are also here inherited from these training data that are taken from, you know, online sources that are that are not yeah. <laughs> uh, diverse and well-informed online sources. And it has also been an <laughs> issue with machine learning for a long time and before it was trained on those large online sources. But those technologies, no matter if it's text, no matter if it's facial analysis, it was already the case when we were also mm -hmm. doing, um, you know, image recognition, uh, have, have had these issues of biases and coded biases and spitting out stereotypes. Of course, when we talk about generative AI, one of the things that I find really important to highlight is so I'm an optimist. I know it. <laughs> and I think that sometimes folks have had too much faith in the idea that with bigger models and more data, we were going to head in generally the right direction in slowly getting better at tackling those biases, those discriminatory impacts, those embedded stereotypes. And we now recently have research that says this is actually not what happens. Abiba Berhan and two of her colleagues just published a wonderful paper that show actually when you get to bigger models that are trained on more data, those racial biases and those stereotypes get worse. You get more of them. And here you can sort of see that we're losing the race in underinvesting in how do we tackle and mitigate and understand those socio-technical impacts of these technologies um, because we're just scaling them too fast, right? We're not catching up with the problems that we know exist. More of the problem doesn't solve the problem. That's right. Right? So I think, you know, I never understood the basis for an assertion that, like, well, you know, we have a little bit of trash and that makes a trashy model, but let's pour a bunch more trash on there. Oh, because gonna that's going to clean it up, right? There's a you know magical thinking, and I think a a real like almost emotional desire by a lot of the true believers to avoid the fact that maybe some of these problems are intractable. Maybe we can't sort of you know create a data set that's unbiased because of course data is always reflecting the perspective of its creators, and that is always biased, right? How do we change this paradigm? How do we make sure that the people who also work on making technology safer? more fair, more responsible, uh, their efforts can also be accelerated and their voice can be centered in the way we talk about AI. I mean, I don't think that's a technical problem, mm -hmm. right? That is a problem of the incentives that are driving the tech industry, which are not social benefit, right? You know, you and I know we got in the way of these people a lot. It was not always appreciated. And I always loved your, your willingness to ask those questions anyway. But I was pushed out of Google for asking these questions, right? For loudly asking these questions, for organizing around these questions, right? So there is a point at which, you know, when you're talking billions of dollars versus a livable future,
we have a system that is choosing billions of dollars repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. And in the context of a system that is now giving this kind of authority, surveillance, and social control capabilities to a handful of actors, I think that is a, that's an alarm worth raising pretty broadly. Can regulation and governments play a role in reestablishing a little bit of balance in that system? Yeah, of course, if they're willing, right? Labor organizing can help that. Social movements can help that. Regulation can help that. But, you know, Regulation is an empty signifier till we fill it with specifics. All right. <laughs> Let's pause here. Let's do a little Q&A, and then we'll talk about how to dismantle those business models and how do we build the future we want. Okay. My question is, you uh, very briefly touched upon that, but when the systems that we encounter on every day in this digitalization and uh, where we are going, the very basis of it is is basically based on private interest, how can we really truly create meaningful change? I think fundamentally that's a question about capitalism, not a question about technology. And so how do we change that hamster wheel that is sort of, you know, in order to avail ourselves of the resources needed to survive, we do waged work. Our waged work, you know, contributes to structures that we may not agree with. And so I've come up with, you know, there are social movements, you know, i I participated in labor organizing after being a kind of in-house you know, public intellectual and uh, expert, you know, thinking that that was a theory of change, right? I'm now a tech executive trying to do tech another way that is not profit-driven, right? That's another theory of change. And I think there's an international workers of the world where a, a union in the U.S. that had a phrase, a kind of slogan that stuck with me, and that's dig where you stand. So it's like, what is your role? What is your, you know, who do you know? What can you do with the knowledge and context you have? And I think that's a question to ask yourself every day, but it's not a question somebody else can answer. I, I agree with that, and, and I will say I struggle with that question too, because um, in, in my fields of practice, both security and trust and safety, the fires that are in the building are the things that you have to attend to immediately. You also want to think about the immediate future, but it's also important sometimes to put out those fires because it can be that your election is at risk. It can be that kids are at risk online. It can be that um, you know terrible societal impacts are unfolding in front of your eyes. And and you know one of the the things that I've been focused on recently is how can we make sure that um, across the industry the folks who are focused on putting out those fires are better equipped so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. And so making sure that we have the rigorous frameworks, the tools, and that all of this is easily accessible, uh, open source, and that people are properly equipped to do this work so that we can also invent alternative futures while we take care of the immediate harms is, is something that's been very top of mind. Let's take another question. Um, do you think that the very public and accelerated move towards an AI um, facilitated workforce has the potential to hold a mirror up to some of the absurdities of the capitalist system in its current state. I, I want to point to sort of an example that will perhaps illustrate my views on this, which is the WGA strike in the US. And the, the WGA, the Writers Guild of America, is a well-established and fairly powerful union that represents writers in Hollywood. So the, the TV shows and the, the films you see, and they struck for a long time over the role of AI in the workplace. So they were saying, you know, you are not studio executives signing a contract with Microsoft for GPT. Going to sort of introduce that to our labor process in a way that justifies your changing our title you're firing us as full-time workers and hiring us back as precarious contractors. You're reducing our wages and you're ultimately degrading the role of our work. So, you know, I think, I think, and they won some pretty serious concessions in that strike. But what that episode showed is that, you know, we're not actually talking about AI replacing workers in a lot of cases. There's a, a research recently published that estimates 100 million people, 100 million people are currently employed or have been employed recently in the task of cleaning and curating data required to train these systems, which is extraordinarily labor intensive. Then you have to do a very 
you know, serious calibration process because these things are trained on 4chan and Reddit and some of the most obscene and disturbing content on the internet that is not often filtered out. And so human beings are the buffer for that. They see this content, they have to say, no, that's not right, no, that's not right. And then you have to have, you know, something that Camille is very familiar with, you know, kind of the cleanup crew, the content moderators, the people who deal with the fact that these systems often say, you know, the wrong thing. So there's a huge amount of labor that actually powers what we call intelligence in these systems. So we should be, we should be aware of uh, that dynamic, know that AI cannot replace workers, it's displacing work, and that it is a tool of, you know, employers, governments, you know, those in power are the ones with the resources to decide where it's used, and it will very likely be used on us in ways that we need to push back against. One more question. Um, so I work in people analytics at a, at a big company, and this is something I struggle with on a daily basis. So forget AI and just think more basic algorithmic hiring, for example. So in a process like this, when you already have something where a human being is going to be subject to tremendous biases, could something like a very well-regulated technology or an algorithm actually help? It's a great question, and I think we can start by saying it's a fair question, right? People have biases. Why does it matter if we also have machines with biases? Um, there's so many reasons for that. And the first one is we don't know just yet how those biases manifest. We have a hard time measuring them. And so we can think about it in sort of like two questions. The first one is, what is the right set of areas in which we can deploy AI, knowing that it's imperfect? The second set of question is, in which ways are you able to detect and mitigate for these potential biases? One that's popular, although that too is a meme, is this idea of red teaming. So you would say, this is the system that I want to use. This is the context in which I will use it. I am going to trigger all the bad scenarios that I will want to not happen so that I can understand if they are about to manifest and I can understand if I'm able to mitigate them. Um, if you're able to answer all of these questions, then yes, by all means, go deploy technologies on areas that you think are uh, not going to hurt people at scale with methods that you have tested and can rely on to ensure that you have awareness of these potential shortcomings and you're able to mitigate them. Um, but that's often not the case, and it's uh, often not the case in, in, in people analytics, for sure. Yeah. I would agree with that. Um, I would also say, you know, humans can be held accountable. They can justify their decisions. And, you know, what Camille presents, I think, is a, is a very good answer, but it's also a counterfactual to the world we live in, right? You know, your whoever is doing the contracting for the vendors is being sold a pitch by some company that's probably reskinning an Amazon or Google API to make claims about sort of detecting inner competence that again things like that bear no you know have no scientific justification and so you know i think you could build a system that helps sort through resumes but that requires an you know, ecosystem of good faith actors putting that use case above their self-interest in many cases that we simply don't live in as a rule. I am encouraged by the fact that some cases have been, um, have been demonstrated with people being held into account. So I'll take the example of proctoring software. Throughout the pandemic, a lot of universities and education institutions uh, turned to AI in order to have students take exams at home while being surveilled or monitored. And they were very clear cases where these types of software had simply not been tested. And so what happened is students started sharing, organizing and saying, my face is not being recognized by the software. I'm getting a bad grade because it thinks that I've cheated. I think that this is a violation of my right. So again, this is this is to say you can still ask the right questions when you fail to have the uh, right questions asked and put the right measures in place. We we see those movements towards accountability. Well, hello.
Hello again, Meredith. Wonderful to be here, Camille. Wonderful to be here with you. Last time we chatted, we talked about risks in AI. Why are some people worried about AI taking over the world and destroying humanity? What is the thing that we call existential risk? Where is this coming from? How do you feel about that? Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> existential risk is, is a thrilling story at a libidinal and emotional level. It's very activating to think of, you know, doom and conflict in these sort of, you know, great power scenarios. And it's kind of catnip to a lot of powerful men. The idea that AI, this, you know, this scraped data, big compute, you know, big models, is gonna somehow find the escape velocity to become sentient and superhuman, and we had better hold on because we either need to control that powerful, powerful, powerful AI, or we're going to be superseded by it. There's no evidence that existential risk is going to happen. I think there's a lot of questions around, like, why now did it catch on so powerfully? And I think a part of this, the answer to that question, and you know, I know, Camille, you think about this as well, is that it's, you know, while there are some true believers for whom this is very meaningful, and I don't want to take that away from them, this is also an extraordinarily good advertisement for these technologies. Because what military, what government, what multinational doesn't want access to this hyper, hyper, hyper powerful AI? Doesn't want to be the one who's sort of controlling it, doesn't want to imagine themselves at the helm of the Death Star. And this advertisement also serves to distract from the fact that these systems continue to be discriminatory and that discriminatory capacity continues to accelerate. The fact that these systems are used by the powerful on those with less power in ways that often obscure accountability for harmful decisions. The fact that we're talking about a technology that is built on the basis of concentrated surveillance power, like the world has never seen, right? But we can erase all of that by being like, look over there, the Terminator is coming. Yeah, you talked about it. It's not exactly a new idea, right? Nick Bostrom wrote Super Intelligence now 10 years ago. It's a book that sort of focuses on that idea that an AI will accelerate to a point where it can no longer be controlled by human and will pose an existential risks. The fact that today this concept dominates some of our conversation on safety is meaningful and worrisome, though, because we're at that pivotal moment where we have governments, for instance, for the first time saying, hey, we would like to organize and to discuss what does safety mean in the context of AI. And so we have governments coming to the table. We saw it with the AI Safety Summit. We saw a series of first declarations, uh, first regulations. There's the White House executive order uh, in the US, the Hiroshima process coming out of the G7. And so there is this urgency to define what is it that we're worried about and that we want our elected representatives to protect us from and to focus on when we talk about the safety of AI. So I think you're right. It doesn't mean that everybody should be laser focused on avoiding Terminator scenarios. It also means that we need to focus on the very immediate harms to society, the biases, the discrimination, uh, the surveillance implications, which we haven't talked about just yeah. yet. I see your, your, your surveillance eyes. Oh, yeah. Yes. I Do was you, should we get there? Smelt in the furnace of concerns over surveillance and privacy. And you know, I think we were around Google at, uh, you know, I think, 2014 or so we met. But that was, that was the post-Snowden era, right? So we came out of the 90s in the US with a regulatory framework that had no guardrails on private surveillance. So a private company could surveil anything, right? And they could surveil it in the name of advertising, right? And so we get, you know, after the 90s and this sort of, you know, permissionless surveillance, you see a lot of very cozy partnerships between the U.S. and other governments and these private surveillance actors, right? So, you know, getting data from them in certain ways, brokering relationships, convincing them to create backdoors in their systems, and this is documented in the Snowden archives, which of course happened in 2013. So this right. was a Should shock to the system. Take a moment to define what's a backdoor. A backdoor is a you know, generally intentional flaw 
in a secure system that allows an, a third party access to contents or communications. So, you know, it would, you know, if we're using an encrypted system, say you and I are texting, and you, we think that is secure, but in fact, the code is allowing a government or a third party to access that and to surveil our communication. So a backdoor is sort of, you know, the colloquial term for a flaw in the system that allows that kind of access. I think here the critical security concept is this idea that you can't have a backdoor that's only for the good guys. And yeah. so if there's a hole in your system, there's a hole in your system. I think that's yeah. why we care so much about uh, strong end-to-end -end encryption and making sure that when we say a system is secure, it's secure for everybody and from everybody. Yeah, it either works for everyone, and that means I can't see it, that means the UK government can't see it, that means Putin can't see it, that means XYZ hackers can't see it, or it's broken and we can all see it. So you were saying 2013, big moment of yeah. reckoning in Silicon Valley over privacy yeah. and those concepts of surveillance. Yeah, and that was, you know, kind of the world I lived in, right? Watching this privatized surveillance apparatus at Google, you know, that had been justified on, you know, hey, we have a duty to our customers and we're just giving people, you know, more useful ads and more useful services, but Snowden kind of broke that open, right? Um, and since then, there's been a kind of uneasy you know, situation where, you know, encryption has been added to some things, but the, the pipeline of data and data cr collection and data creation continues because that is, again, monetizing surveillance is the economic engine of the tech industry. And so, again, mm -hmm. what happened in 2012? There was a recognition that this surveillance data could also be used to train and tune AI, and that these AI systems were incredibly good at both conducting surveillance, so think about facial recognition, think about productivity monitoring. I think that we have to read AI as almost a surveillance derivative, right? It pulls from this surveillance business model, it requires this surveillance data and the infrastructures that are constructed to process and store this data, and it produces more data and sort of heightens the um, surveillance ecosystem that we all live in. You know, it's, it's also what I've observed working on disinformation and on troll farms in 2017. Um, I was doing some field work, you know, before that, around 2015, or and working with those journalists and human rights activists, including Maria, um, who were so often targeted by governments their phones were being hacked. We were very concerned about making sure that they had secure software. We could secure their phones, secure their computers. They were very much uh, under heavy surveillance. I remember they were the first ones to say, hey, there's something a bit off that's happening on social media. And we think it's harmful, we think it's violence, and we think it's related to the hacking. We should take it seriously and we should try to uncover what's really going on, and we should really apply the same rigors and tools that we had in our work on cybersecurity and say, we can analyze this, we can do forensics, we might even be able to attribute it. If we see networks of fake accounts that are deployed against a journalist or a human rights activist with the sole purpose of silencing them, threatening them, and we might be able to um, hold a few people accountable in this process. We were, of course, sort of slow to do that as an industry, and that created the sort of great reckoning of 2017, right? What it took for Silicon Valley to care about that is really the US presidential election of 2016 and the fact that Russia was able to use what we now call troll farms, right? A series of handful of fake accounts to, to have, um, you know, to have a campaign against these presidential elections. And what, what followed after is a full year of technology executives having to go to Congress uh, and justify why they had missed it. So that, I think, was also sort of similarly a really pivotal moment yeah. where uh, some new foundations um, were established for, OK, maybe we now live in a world where, as a society, we feel that technology companies have a responsibility to protect democracies too. And that we feel technology companies have a responsibility to tackle disinformation um, and then to think about how their technologies can be abused to manipulate elections. 
that is also something that's coming up for us in AI in a really interesting way. But what I am concerned about, in addition to those very real, very pernicious problems that happen when you mass scale a global you know, information and social platform, you know, again, incentivized for sort of clicks and engagement and profits and surveillance and advertising, is that the solution space, in my view, seems not to go far enough. So you have something like the UK's Online Safety Act, which is this massive omnibus bill that was catalyzed through these very real concerns, right? What do we do about these problems? But they rarely look at that business model and the sort of, you know, they, they take as a given these mass social platforms. And then the solutions often look a lot like extending surveillance and control to governments, expanding the surveillance apparatus of large tech companies to, you know, government chosen NGOs or government actors who will then have a hand in determining what is acceptable speech, what is acceptable content, but is not actually looking at, you know, how do we attack the surveillance business model that is at the heart of this engine? And so, you know, this is very real for me, and we're both based in the U.S., but we now have, you know, books being banned in certain states. We have, you know, reproductive health care or health care in general unavailable to many people in states where reproductive health care has been you know, criminalized. So, you know, I really worry about these problems with platforms, about the way they exacerbate hate and allow trolling and disinformation. I also really worry about the solution space when that is handing a key to governments that would lock up a woman and her daughter for accessing health care, that would ban books, and that, you know, across the world are trending toward the authoritarian. Absolutely. And so what we need, I think, is also a diversity of these platforms, right? Platforms that are not uh, tied to these surveillance capitalism business models, platforms that can put security and privacy first, that can operate in the public interest. Yep. And I think that's what we're doing with Signal. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Ourselves from the sins of the 90s. And doing redeeming it ourselves from the sins of the 90s. Yeah. Speaking this of religion, This is not a fashion right? commentary, um, right? This is, well, it's fashionable commentary now. And it's a so. crypto <laughs> and it's a crypto war commentary. It is a crypto war commentary. It is a crypto war commentary. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what's happening with Signal. Um, I was very excited to see that you published a piece about how much it takes to run Signal. Yeah. And you said it costs 50 million a year to actually operate this technology globally. Yeah. Why did you do that? And uh, how are you using 50 million a year to yeah. make Signal work at scale? Well, we did that in part because we are a nonprofit, a rare nonprofit, not a fake nonprofit like OpenAI, an actual nonprofit <laughs> um, that operate in a tech space, again, dominated by this business model. So. We, one, wanted to be accountable to the people who rely on Signal, the tens and tens of millions of people across the globe who use this as critical infrastructure, who donate to keep us running. And we wanted to offer a cross-section of just how expensive it is to develop and maintain highly available global communications infrastructure, these sort of, you know, free products and services, so and thus shed light on how profitable this industry is and how significant the monetization of surveillance is in terms of a revenue generator. We're a nonprofit because the engine of profit is invading privacy. And our, our function, our sole focus is creating a truly private communication app where we don't have the data, you don't have the data, you know, the cops or Facebook or anyone doesn't have the data because it's only available to you. But then the question is, okay, without the data to create the revenue to cover $50 million a year. And by the way, $50 million is very cheap. So how are we going to guarantee privacy while supporting you know, what it takes to actually produce an app that works for everyone? And we, you know, I think that question is way, way bigger than Signal. And I think it's one we need to be asking of every company out here. Where's the money? And that sort of is a nice nod to how we started this conversation, which is making sure, too, that the money goes to tackling those very risks to safety, yeah. to moderation, to privacy, right? Making sure that the investments are also 
keeping, yeah. you know, keeping in line with the, with the, with detecting and managing those socio-technical harms. That is a good uh, segue for us to take a few questions, either on the infrastructure, inventing new resourcing models. So we spoke a lot about corporations, governments, their roles. I think it's almost embarrassingly easy how individuals, everybody in this room, hits the consent button when we want to read a thing on a web page and we lose all of that data. How do you go from being the minority of individuals need to recognize they protect their own data versus the easy access to information and giving that up? I don't think this is a matter of individual choice or individual blame. We can't function in this world without using these services, right? You know, we have to do this to get a job, to function in the workplace, to go to school, to have a robust social life in a world where so many of our, you know, public spaces and ways of communicating with each other have been hollowed out by these platforms. I actually think it can be really dangerous to make this a, you know, an issue of individual will or intellect or consciousness. I think, you know, what we're talking about is a a deeper collective issue where our lives are shaped by the necessity to use these systems. And where, like, look, Facebook creates ghost profiles for people who are not on Facebook in order to fill in your social graph. Data tells you something about the people who aren't represented in the data the same way it tells you about the people who are. I'm encouraged by um, new frameworks that are emerging that are maybe helping us think a little bit more collectively about our data. And so, for instance, in the United States, a lot of people are working around this idea of data trust um, and this idea that you have data rights and you can also work with organizations who may represent your data rights, make it easier for people to collectively say, yes, I will entrust a nonprofit that is trusted to make sure that I can exercise my right. Uh, and this, per this, this entity, so for instance, can be also collectively bargaining to make sure that Again, collective rights are being represented. I think that we're heading towards new, new frameworks, new governance mechanisms, new regulations, where we think a little bit more collectively about our data. Let's take another question. So far, our conversation or your conversation has been pretty US centric and you know, rightfully so. But what do you think about the essentially AI arms race between the US and China and what it means for the relationship between the two countries as well as the impact on the rest of the world? You know, there are very valid concerns about the kind of, you know, the potential for the misuse of this technology. I'm not going to dismiss those. But for me, this is a, an economic arms race. You know, which poll, the US or China, is going to engage, you know, as much of the world as possible in kind of AI client states, right? Provide the infrastructure, provide the APIs, provide the sort of, you know, affordances so that, you know, they can both extract data and sort of, you know, and revenue from, you know, various countries and, um, you know, maintain, you know, control through these, these companies. So I think... You know, I think there's a lot more to say about that framework. You know, when we talk about a race, we really need to be asking, like, where are we racing to? Is this a race to the bottom of sort of, you know, two poles of an economic surveillance state that are exercising massive social control over the rest of the world? And is that a race we want to win? When I think about, um, you know, government sort of rushing to make those investments and us talking about those arm race, of course, I also think about the fact that we have little agreement on what are the legitimate ways to deploy AI in military context, in conflict context. How does AI shape the laws of war? And Gaza. I mean, Gaza, That we have investigative reporting that you know, targeting is being done by AI, that there's a massive AI apparatus, and that you know, we're witnessing a significant significant, unspeakable civilian casualties, I even think, in that context. I think these are very important questions. We are, unfortunately, in a world where we have multiple wars and conflicts, and seeing governments accelerate to both build and deploy those types of new technologies in conflict context must give us pause and help us ask to what are the rules of the road for the deployments of these technologies in these contexts too? So, um, you know, you're, when, when we talk about arms race, this is sort of first where my mind goes, for sure. So we'll take one last question. 
there are information vacuums right now, which are good breeding grounds for disinformation. And what do we do when, you know, you, Meredith, push back on the online safety now act surveillance powers in that? So when you see government and big tech censors fusing their powers, is the solution like break up big tech? I, like you, am very concerned about this sort of metastasis of surveillance and censorship powers again, in the hands of, you know, governments and corporations that don't always reflect, you know, community norms or, you know, the you know, social benefit or the interests of the marginalized or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't have a solution for, like, the one weird trick to do to solve it, but I think it's going to require social movements because, again, you're looking at sort of entrenched power and a kind of government... Government is willing to weaponize the language of accountability and the language of reducing big tech harm in contexts where that expands sort of the big tech model or the authority to governments, right? But what we haven't seen are sort of, you know, bold regulations. There is not political will to use the regulatory framework. So I think there needs to be much more demand. And I think about it almost as like, you know, a kind of dignified stance, right? Like, we don't want to live in this world. And we should have the imagination and I think, you know, like the, the deep optimism, right? That is re willing to recognize a world in trouble, in danger, in, you know, terrible peril, isn't looking away from that with Pollyanna eyes, and then is demanding changes to that with a clear map of just how bad it is. That's a very elegant phrasing to say that we, we should and we are able to invent alternative futures, alternative models, and then to, to say, indeed, like, this is, this is not how we want to live with technology. It's not being a Luddite to say these are not models that should continue, right? Let's invent alternative futures that are more rights-preserving, that are better for society, um, that are better for the planet, too. That's yeah. also huge climate implications and everything that you just said around surveillance capitalism that we don't talk nearly enough about. Yeah, I mean, there's a history of computation that actually traces it back to plantation management techniques that were used to discipline, control, and surveil enslaved African people as part of the transatlantic slave trade. And I've written on this, sort of the history of computation as taking templates from those labor control mechanisms at the sort of birth of industrialization. What paradigms were they reflecting and refracting? And no, that doesn't mean we throw them away. That means we're mindful and we just like, in a kind of punk rock spirit, we demand more of them. I love that. I think that this <laughs> is a perfect ending. Let's embrace that punk rock spirit. Let's demand more. Let's invent better futures. Thank you so much for this conversation together. Thank you, Thank you. Four episodes of this special series on AI, we've gone beyond the headlines and hype, spoken to scientists and industry leaders working to align profit motives with safety, as well as examined the coded bias that is already impacting our world. When real life is now stranger than fiction, we need to step back, look at the history of AI, how it's impacting economies around the world, how it is affecting violence and warfare, and what steps we can take now to make AI safe and ethical for us all.